Thank you all so much for having me here and for being here. This is amazing. I think this is like the best seminar room I've been to because you have this like view of the lake and like being from the Bahamas, I'm always like super calm. So thanks for having me here. So the title of the project is, Is Spending on Schools Efficient? A National Study of the Capitalization of School Spending and Local Taxes. And this work is joint with one of my uh, PhD students from Clemson, Kenny Whaley, who is on the job market this year. So look out for him, Chris. And Pat Bayer, a <laughs> colleague from Duke <laughs> University. Just because we were done by the joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a little inside <laughs> joke. Um, what I like to She's do. Much more important than me. Yeah. <laughs> how, many, how many graduate students are in the room? If you can just raise your hands. Okay, awesome. What I like to do with my talks, too, is to kind of make it a bit educational for the graduate students as well, too, in terms of like unpacking some of the research process. That way you walk away with that in addition to like the substantive part of the talk. So this paper, as I mentioned, is joint with one of my PhD students. Let me just give you a broad overview of who I am as an economist and like how this work fits into the types of questions that I'm interested in. So I am an, <coughs> an applied microeconomist and I specialize in education labor and public <laughs> economics. And I'm really interested in like how the educational system in concert with neighborhoods can work to promote equality within the labor market. So that's kind of like the big overarching question within my work. And today's talk is going to be on spending and is it occurring at the efficient level within schools. And we're going to be thinking about efficiency in kind of like a very narrow economic sense. Um, so we can chat about that some more. And just to give you a sampling of some of my other work, so I have some work on occupational licensing where we show that licensing reduces racial and gender wage gaps because the license functions as a signal of non-felony status. Um, the, paper <laughs> the paper that Jeff was mentioning is with one of my um, colleagues at Wharton, Kent Smetters, where we look at why is it that elite universities have not been expanding the size of their college classes um, over time. I know Chow, you've done like a lot of tremendous work, which we cite in, in that paper. Uh, my job market paper is on neighborhood tipping points. And Chris, you and I talked about um, a paper with one of my other students who you mentored at the inequality workshop on gender uh, labor market flexibility and like when is that in a sense when does that reduce gender wage gaps and the headline from that paper is we find that the gender wage gap is much smaller among part-time workers and full-time workers and it's been so for the past 30 years but family flexible policies like the FMLA have actually been capitalized into the wages of women now all of this work is not done by me I'm not an island this work is done collaboratively um, I have a group of five PhD students that work in my research group across um, Clemson and Harvard. Um, also two undergraduates, one pre-doc, one post-doc, and faculty collaborators at several universities. <coughs> this is my favorite slide where I get to show you my students, because you guys are an incredible part of the process, and students are a huge amenity for faculty to be able to like work with and to train. This is Kenny, who is one of the co-authors on this paper. I'm going to start off with a quote from like a really old paper. <coughs> by Charles Thibault from 1958. And let me read this quote. One of the most important recent developments in the area of applied, micro applied economic theory has been the work of Musgrave and Samuelson. So this is like a paper from 1939. This is one from 1954. And this is Paul Samuelson in public finance theory. The two writers agree on what is probably the most which is probably the major point under investigation, namely that no market type solution exists to determine the level of expenditures on public goods. Seemingly, we are faced with the problem of having a rather large portion of our national income allocated in a non-optimal way when compared to the private sector. And so the big question was really the free rider problem. If you're trying to produce a public good, people who are going to ultimately use it might lie about the extent to which they really value it so that they can be under tax for this. And this will result in the under provision of this public good. So what was the revolution that Thibault brought to the economics profession? His basic insight was, well, perhaps at the federal level, it's difficult to do that. But at the local level, if you have lots of different jurisdictions, which are providing a bundle of public goods and also a level of taxation in order to finance that public goods, that competitions across these jurisdictions could actually lead to the efficient allocation of these goods at the local level. It could be that people are sorting to the places, in a sense like voting with their feet, that provide the right mix of taxation and also the public good too. And so that's kind of like the core idea. <coughs> Something else that I want to highlight too is this paper by Oates in 1969 in the JP, where he argues that, well, one way to test for this is to really see that if you raise taxation by 1% in order to use that money from taxation to spend on the public good, would it raise house prices? And if the level of provision of the public good is efficient, then it shouldn't raise house prices. Because if it did raise house prices, then that means there's an arbitrage opportunity. You can tax people more, provide the public good, folks are going to value it, and they're going to want to move into the neighborhood. 
right? And <coughs> we're going to be using this test in our context to for, for, for TBU's hypothesis. And we're going to do this in the context of schools. We're going to think about local public schools as a type of, of public good. It's not a strict public good in the strictest sense of the word. And in the TBU paper, there's like a lot of discussion about how we should define public goods more broadly to, to accommodate this fact. But one of the reasons why this is a nice context to test this really important idea in economics, which is can we provide public goods at a local level, is because spending on education is like a huge part of GDP in the U.S. context. And not just in America, but not just in the U.S., but elsewhere too. Attendance to public schools is generally requires like living in the district, and so it's a very like local phenomenon as well. Moreover, public schools are going to be funded in large part through these local property taxes as well too. So you have both the provision is happening at the local level of the public good, but also the taxation is happening at a local level too. So you get this bundle that each jurisdiction is going to be providing. <coughs> and there's also evidence that increased expenditures on schools has a causal relationship with respect to increases in test scores and also uh, labor market outcomes of workers as well too. And so we might think that this actually is a public good that matters, which in turn should be capitalized into house prices, right? Both the value of expenditures on schooling, but also the disutility that households get from, from tests are going to be capitalized into house prices, and that's going to allow us to do our efficiency test. Um, before you move on, so Please. you're going to put some new measure of efficiency that's based on, like, you're looking at test scores, and uh, in, in terms of quality, that's based on test scores. So, quality, just how are you accepting? yeah, so the way that we're going to think about efficiency is really there's evidence that shows us that increased expenditures on schools leads to better outcomes for kids. Intermediate outcomes like test scores, and you might have problems with test scores because test scores, there's fade out. But moreover, there's also like later labor market outcomes as well too. So for example, reduced adult poverty, um, increased wages, lower unemployment. And the idea here is going to be that if households really recognize that their kids are going to be better off later on in life, they should be willing to move to places that has more expenditures on public schools, holding everything else constant too. And so the house prices in those areas should be greater, right? So you, you're willing to pay more for a district that spends more on education. So we're going to take the expenditure on education as kind of a catch-all. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay. All right. So here are three main research questions. So the first research question is the following. How much do households value school expenditures on average and also by geography? So we're going to split our sample by urban, rural, and suburban. So this is basically saying how much does, do house prices go up when you spend more in schools? But then also to like how sensitive are house prices to increases in taxation that you're going to need to fund these schools as well too? And how does that vary by geography? So that's going to be the second research question. And then the third is that given these two elasticities, the elasticity of house prices with respect to school spending and also taxation is the level of expenditures on schools efficient. So that's going to be, these are going to be the three main research questions. <coughs> Let me talk first about how this problem is typically, typically tackled in the literature. And that's going to provide some context for what we do here that's going to be different. So there's some very pioneering work by Sandy Black and also by uh, my co-author Pat Bayer and, and some of his colleagues that uses these boundary discontinuity designs. And so the basic idea is the following. You're within a school district. And you have these different school attendance zones, and you compare people that live on opposite sides of the school attendance zone. So in one school attendance zone, the schools are really good, and test scores on average are really high. In the other school attendance zone, right across the board, the test scores are comparatively lower. But the people along the boundary are going to be similar. They have similar neighborhoods, et cetera. And so any differences in the house prices are really going to be reflecting the differences that the difference, the dif are really going to be reflecting the extent to which households value the increase in test scores that's changing discontinuously across this threshold. So that's typically what's been, what's been done, right? The second, the second kind of approach is to use these infrastructure bond elections. So there's a 2007 paper um, by Cellini and co-authors where they use the state of California, which has these, um, el which has these election bonds, basically you vote on whether or not you want to have more infrastructure spending on schools. And in their context, they're going to focus in on the elections that were like very close. And they're going to say, well, the, the, in the place, in the counties, in the districts where the elections just narrowly carried, they're going to get kind of like an exogenous increase in expenditure on, on infrastructure. 
And in the places where it didn't carry, they didn't. So that, that's going to be their treatment and control group too. <coughs> and what they're going to find is that this increased infrastructure expenditures are going to be capitalized into house prices. Let me talk about what some of the limitations are of the current approach and the ways in which we're going to try to build on that. So when we look at the boundary discontinuity design, the outcome is going to be test scores. And test scores may actually understate the true value of schools because there's a ton of fade out in test scores. And then there are also other things that schools do too. Like schools may also improve socio-emotional skills, right? And that's not going to be captured in test scores. This boundary discontinuity design is also going to require that taxes and school spending is constant across the boundary, the school attendance boundary too. Because otherwise, we would not be able to cleanly attribute the difference in the test scores to differences, I mean the differences in the house prices to just the differences in the test scores too. And so fundamentally with this approach, you're not going to be able to estimate the elasticity of house prices with respect to spending and taxes in order to do the efficiency exercise that's going to be required from the OATS test. The data requirements are also going to be pretty large too because you're going to need tons of local house prices for a given area across both sides of the boundary, so huge amount of data requirements. And typically that's going to limit your external validity by just allowing you to narrowly focus in on <coughs> a particular geography at a particular time. When we look at the bond elections, the data requirements are also going to be really high because you need elections, you need a lot of them, and you need a lot of close elections too, right? <coughs> and then also the outcome focuses mainly on infrastructure spending too. So we're not going to be able to capture all types of spending within that, within that framework. Okay. So what, is, what are we going to do in this paper in terms of as a way to build on this literature, which has really helped us to understand the extent to which households value schools? We're going to do a couple of things. So first, we're going to take these school finance reforms um, that were shown in the Jackson et al. paper as a, so a source of plausibly exogenous variation in school expenditures. And so the basic idea is going to be that there are, there, there's going to be like a rollout of these state Supreme Court cases that invalidated the way in which schools were funded previously. And we're going to compare districts that were in the lowest part of the spending distribution before these court mandated reforms and look and see like how did those districts end up getting like more spending because of the reforms. And we're going to control for a lot of pre-reform characteristics so that we don't have any differences in the pre-trends um, in these districts based on where they were in the pre-reform spending distribution. And so this has already been established in the literature. Uh, we're gonna, what we're going to show to you is that these school finance reforms also induce plausibly exogenous variation in terms of the taxation too. So a lot of these reforms created incentives for districts to raise taxes. Uh, we're going to show using an event study design that there are no pre-trends there, like very little pre-trends there. And so we're going to have this source of exogenous variation for taxes too. We're also going to have a time series of local house price indices <coughs> for over three decades. And so we're going to be able to use that in concert with, these two sor with, with this source of exogenous variation in the school expenditures and also the taxes to estimate the elasticity of house prices with respect to both school expenditures and also taxes, and then perform the efficiency test as well too. Right? One of the things that we're able to do with this context is we can use a national sample because these, these school finance reforms are going to be ruling out over, um, I think, on the order of like 30 states over like a period of about 30 or 40 years. Also, all of the data are going to be publicly available that we're going to use. And so the data requirements are not that stringent. We're using publicly available like local house price data at the census tract level. Okay. <coughs> and then we're going to be able to say something about the capitalization of school spending and also taxes both in urban, suburban, and rural districts. Whereas in the boundary discontinuity design, for example, you might not have enough population density to do that kind of a strategy. So what are our key findings? So the first key finding is going to be that school expenditure is going to be heavily capitalized into house prices, an elasticity of between 0.7 and 0.86. <coughs> We're also going to find that House, the capitalization of school expenditures is going to be higher in places where the elasticity of supply is lower. So places like San Francisco and like other cities where either for zoning reasons or even for geographical reasons, it's really difficult to build a new stock of housing. If you spend more money on schools in those places, it's really going to bid up the house prices a lot in those contexts. The second thing that we're going to show is that local taxes are negatively capitalized into house prices, which is something that you would expect holding all else constant, people don't like to pay taxes. So that's good. 
that we're getting a negative estimate for our um, tax for our taxes and the tax capitalization is going to be most negative in the suburban and the rural areas too so there's geographic heterogeneity in the extent to which households are responding to increased expenditures on schools but also increased uh, taxation as well too now for the thing that we've been waiting for, what are the results of the efficiency test? So we can combine these two elasticities to show that a 1% increase in taxes to finance education is going to increase house prices by 0.06%. So an elasticity of 0.06. And so this is really economically very small, and it's also going to be statistically insignificant in our context too. So what this is going to suggest is this is going to provide evidence that at the, on average, school expenditures are efficiently funded. Let me stop here and say one quick note about efficiency. What we are not doing is accounting for the fact that some people might be low-income folks and they can't afford to spend more on schools. And so that's a natural constraint, right? And so to the extent that we as a society think that education is a fundamental right, you might actually want to subsidize education, especially of low-income folks, above and beyond that. So this is, it's efficient given the income distribution and given no preferences for like redistribution across, across districts. So that's, it's efficient in this more limited um, sense. But it's still an important efficiency to consider given that this is the test that has been very central to this local public finance um, literature. <laughs> Let me talk about a couple of auxiliary findings, Chris. Can I ask, maybe you can put this no, of course. But, but it seems like one of the major issues here is the is heterogeneity. So you're yeah. going to have old guys like me where my kids have left the house. Right. Then you're going to have people that currently have kids. Right. And then you're going to be people that don't have kids, but they're moving to a house and expect to have kids. Yeah. Right. Their willingness to pay for schools is going to be very different. Yeah. Right. So yeah. how how do you even decide what what the optimal level is. So that's a, uh, so you can take that in two directions. You can say either one, um, should we dig a little bit deeper and try to understand like how <coughs> the process by which these jurisdictions are going to be coming up with the level of expenditures. And what we're gonna say in this context is we're not gonna do that. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're really gonna think about this as you have a lot of different like sub-markets that are providing these bundles of taxes and also amenities, which is the expenditures and people are gonna be sorting. <coughs> yeah, so this is, these, these estimates are really gonna be averaging over a lot of that within district heterogeneity too. We don't have a way with public data to get at something that's narrower than this. Let me continue, does that answer your question? Sort of, okay. <laughs> All right. Let me show you the results of this efficiency test by geography. This gets at a source of heterogeneity, not exactly the source of heterogeneity that you um, wanted, but this is certainly um, a contribution to the literature as well. What we can show is in rural areas, a 1% increase in taxes to finance education increases house prices by 0.0008%. <laughs> this is like, this is, this is zero. In suburban areas, <laughs> we didn't cut the books on that at all. In suburban areas, it's 0.2%, which is really small too. In urban areas, it's 0.2, right? And so these are all statistically insignificant. We're trying to do something to get some more precision on these estimates. But also, and this is certainly for the graduate students in the room, it's not just about um, the statistical significance. It's also about the economic importance too. That's something that's going to be really important. This point estimate is an order of magnitude larger than all of these other point estimates too, and I'll get to you in a second, Jeff, right? And so if education is underfunded anywhere, it's potentially underfunded in urban school districts. Jeff. So another heterogeneity might be heterogeneity across districts and the ability to turn money into learning. Yeah. How should I think about that? And does someone have a pen? Oh, I have a pen, I can write this down. The heterogeneity in the b in of schools to turn money into learning. L that actually dovetails with this really well. So we have an auxiliary result in the paper too where we're able to separate the, um, we're able to separate the expenditures into salary and non-salary um, um, funds. And the, the intuition behind this is that, I think it's Josh Hyman has a paper. He has, he has a recent paper, I think in AJ Applied, where he shows that schools that spent more on salaries that actually increased um, test scores a lot more. And what we find is that salary expenditures are actually more heavily capitalized into house prices than non-salary expenditures too, consistent with that. So you can think that this is evidence that households are rational as well too. 
Yeah, do the level shifts maybe matter more than the elasticities? Because if, if my tax expenditures go up by a dollar, all else equal, I might pay one less dollar for a house. Yeah. We can, we can do it. We can do it in terms of dollars, too, and we should. Like, that's something that we debated. Let me make a note of that. So this is for the efficiency test, right? Yeah. Yeah, we can do it in dollars. Thank you. Okay. You? Yeah. Well, one thing I was thinking in that regard is that if, if voters understand which districts are not good at turning funds into learning, yeah. The existing funding levels prior to the school finance reform will reflect that knowledge. And so the districts that get a big money boom from the school finance reform will be districts that the voters thought were badly run. And that would affect how you think about the external validity of your estimate, I think. I mean, there could be other reasons to why they weren't getting more money too, right? Because I mean like it could there's redlining happening, there's segregation, I'm there's not like saying that there aren't other factors. Yeah. Right? So, so then you'd say that those districts that got like a larger shock, those would be the districts that voters... average would be less well-managed than the districts. Less re well-resourced. Mm -hmm. there, there would be, there would be exactly. either like less, they're, they're certainly less well-resourced and that could be because of mismanagement or it could be because of um, other factors like redlining, discrimination, or just the people are poor. Right, so it, it could be, but we, we, we have a second paper where we're going to do like a follow-up where we're going to look at how did the shock vary by like how poor the district was or how like black the district was. One of the things that's really surprising, and this is going to anchor the second paper, is if you look at heterogeneity in the fraction black um, across these school districts, it seems as if these school finance reforms were able to target um, poor areas, but they actually redistributed away from black areas. So this is an example of like a poverty policy that actually um, did not help black people, even though poverty and race are highly correlated too, right? And so in that paper, what we're really going to be doing is making the argument that oftentimes in the policy space, we think, oh, let's not focus on race. Let's just focus on poverty, right? But this would have been a really big program in which we were race neutral on the face of it, only looking at poverty, but actually did things that may have potentially led to even lower resources for African Americans. <coughs> okay. Yes. Just the Salini, Ferreira, and Rothstein, they find, for the bond elections, they yeah. find big positive effects of the thing passing on house prices. Yeah. That outside of... Um, no, no, that's a good point, because we actually, so we have, we, we separate into salary and non-salary, and so you can think about their, uh, you can think about their, like, the relationship between our estimates on non-salary expenditures in their estimates. Um, we find like non-salary expenditures seem to be like negatively capitalizing the prices. This could happen for a number of reasons. Like non-salary contains infrastructure, but it contains other stuff. So it could be that this other stuff is, is less efficient. It could also be the case that it could also be the case that, so their identifying variation is really coming off of places that narrowly passed versus didn't. So it could really be that their late is targeting a different population, whereas we're getting like an average. So maybe at the margin, like infrastructure, infrastructure investments are actually valuable, which makes sense. Why else would people vote for it if it's not valuable, right? But then away from the margin, like for these inframarginal places, maybe it's infrastructure is not like a good investment. Okay. And we go until what time? 1.30. 1.30? Okay, perfect. All right. Yeah, we're going to have a good time. So let me talk about our contributions to, to knowledge. So, so conceptually, like, we demonstrate empirically that local public good provision can overcome the free rider problem in the way that we've defined efficiency within the economics literature with all of those um, caveats that I mentioned earlier. And we also provide corroborating evidence that school expenditures matter. This was like a really big debate in education starting with the Coleman report where there was an evidence of a correlation between high, more expenditures and better school performance. Subsequent to that, using better variation, a lot of papers have shown that when we spend more money on schools, that we get better outcomes. And the fact that school expenditures are capitalized into house prices is corroborating evidence for, um, for, for, for what we see elsewhere in the literature. In terms of the, me in terms of the methodological contributions, we, we identify a new source of variation that we can use to jointly estimate both the house price elasticity with respect to um, spending and also taxations, and then we can use that to do this efficiency test. It also reduces the data limitations because, again, all of these data are publicly available. 
and we're able to reduce these data limitations while increasing the external validity on several dimensions. So the first dimension is we have a national sample. So it's not just about a very local place. It's also like something that goes across time. It also, s this design also works really well to in sparsely populated areas because we just need to know what's the average spending and what's the average house prices in those districts as well too. And um, this design also is going to work for different types of spend expenditures, infrastructure as well as total expenditure as well too. So these are our contributions. Does it matter at all that you have overlapping tax jurisdictions? Or have you thought about that, right? Like um, potentially in some places, right, um, you have the same jurisdiction that you're paying for, you know, garbage collection yeah. and fire protection and, mm -hmm. and, and other places like I've read something in like Cook mm -hmm. County, they have like places where you have 13 different mm -hmm. overlapping. So I'm just thinking that the overall taxation might be different and the schools are only one part of that. So our thought on this is we're looking at tax revenues that have gone to, sp to, to fund schools. And so this is the subset of that total taxation that's going to schools too. So we're kind of like bracketing only that discrete um, part of it. You're absolutely right that there are different like levels of taxation that's happening. We're really focusing in on the local tax variation that is going to be used specifically to fund the local schools. But that might amount to something different in terms of your total like tax, right? Like your property taxes, right? That are like what you're into like home so the right. we're, we're looking at property taxes that were we're looking at yeah we're looking at the property taxes that were used to fund schools does that make sense so not like overall property taxes but like the the portion of the property taxes value. say that again i'm just trying to understand the extent to which they're related to overall house so there's a portion of the property taxes that are going to be used to fund schools and we look, we're, we're identifying exogenous variation in that specific bucket that's funding the local schools. And we're saying what's the co-variation between that and the local house price indices. If there are other parts of the property taxes that are also affecting home values, we're not gonna be picking up the co-variation between that and the house prices in our measure. Does that, okay, awesome. <coughs> What's the related literature? So there's this classic literature in public finance going back to Musgrave, tracing through Samuelson, Thibault, and Oates. Um, there's also this literature on the capitalization of test scores into house prices, and also a huge literature on school finance reforms and their effects on student uh, outcomes. And just to give you a little bit of background on the, the school finance reforms, basically there was a huge amount of inequality mm -hmm. in the ways in which schools were funded because they were funded with local property taxes, so places that were poorer got less money. Right? And <coughs> let's see. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this. So to combat this inequality, like many states invalidated these, these school finance um, legislation at the, uh, at the local level, and we're really going to be using the rollout of that across space to generate variation in school expenditures at the local level. Let me tell you about the house price data, which is something that we're bringing, that we're bringing here. So this house price data is from the Federal Housing Finance Agency. And they're going to collect data from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac on these conventional mortgages. And so that's going to be a ton of mortgages. They're going to collect them for all of the 50 states in the U.S. as well as the District of Columbia. And so the coverage is pretty good. And they're going to use these to construct a quality, a constant quality local home price index. So what they're going to do is look at the same house that transacts multiple times and look at the price appreciation over that time period. And there are lots of kind of adjustments for like how long it's on the market, et cetera, too. And so this is, this is going to be holding quality constant. Um, its advantage relative to just a Case-Shiller index is going to be it's highly local because these indices are going to be at the census track level. Um, it's also quality adjusted and it's high frequency and it has national coverage too. Whereas the Case-Shiller, there are certain um, metropolitan areas where they don't have the index because you're not required to disclose uh, the sale value of the property on the deeds in, in 13 states in the U.S. And we're going to merge this in with some school finance data from the NCES on per pupil expenditure, the U.S. Census of Government Finances, the Common Core, and then we're going to use um, the Johnson, Jackson, and Persico paper from 2016 <coughs> to give us, to, to define our timing of these court-mandated reforms. 
And we're going to use the first court-mandated reform in each state, not the subsequent ones too, because those subsequent reforms might be endogenous. Right? Whereas with the first ones, it's kind of like you don't really know when these, these you, know, you don't know when the court is going to decide. So for example, at Harvard, we've been waiting since I think like last summer on the affirmative action ruling. It could have happened like two months after, it could have happened the following year. And, and we're going to be leveraging that as a source of random variation. We're also going to use the, the 1960 U.S. Census to construct some county level controls for like changes in the racial composition and the income composition of neighborhoods too, to, 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 to look at what's the effect net of some of these changes that we think might have happened anyway. And we're going to use these estimates of the elasticity of housing supply from the SIAS 2010 paper, which combines a notion of geographic scarcity of housing with regulation, like regulatory scarcity in a sense. So these two forms of <coughs> variation. This just gives you a sense of our summary statistics. And then you can see overall total expenditures in the data. It's around about 11,000, like $12,000 per pupil. And of that, about 40-ish percent are going to come from the local property tax revenue. And then the rest is going to come from the state and from other sources of revenue. Uh, about 30% of our areas are going to be urban areas. Sorry, hold on. Yes. <coughs> and then about 60% are going to be suburban, and like very few are going to be rural areas. Okay. Let me show you this quote about the, the, the reforms, just so that you get a sense of like why various state Supreme Courts thought that the, the school finance regulations were unconstitutional. So this is Serrano versus Priest, which was the first such decision, and I'm just going to read this. We are called upon to determine whether the California public school financing system, with its substantial dependence on local property taxes and resultant wide disparities in school revenue, violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. We have determined that this funding scheme invidiously discriminates against the poor because it makes the quality of a child's education a function of the wealth of his parents and neighbors. Recognizing, as we must, that the right to an education in our public schools is a fundamental interest which cannot be conditioned on wealth, we can discern no compelling state purpose necessitating the present method of financing. We have concluded, therefore, that such a statement cannot withstand constitutional challenge and must fall before the Equal Protection Clause. And so this was the first in a sequence of a lot of other types of reforms. Many activists started to target um, various states to try to invalidate um, these school finance laws. In some places they, lo they lost, in some places they won. Um, and this is going to be the, the timing that we're going to be leveraging in our context. Let me show you an example of this. So the state of Washington in 1977 had school finance reforms. This is Washington broken out into um, the various like school districts. And places in green are going to be places where the spending in that district is close to the average spending across the whole state. Places in red are going to be where it's like very different, and places in yellow are going to be in between. So before the reform, you see lots of red places, right, where either you had like a lot more expenditure than the mean or a lot less. After the reform in 1980, you see a lot of these red areas are filled in with like greens and yellows, and you see in 1990, like that pattern continues to. So that's just basically saying that there is some bite in terms of these school finance reforms. This is comparing two different states. This is the state of Missouri in 1990 versus 2000. This is the state of Illinois in 1990 versus 2000. Um, Missouri had a reform in 1993. And you can see going from 1990 to 2000, you see a lot of these red areas now become green and yellow, whereas in Illinois, the graphs look more similar across time too. So this is basically saying that these reforms have some bite. So what are we going to do empirically in our context? We're going to follow Jackson, Johnson, and Persico, and we're going to set the event time to be um, the year of the first school finance reform. And we're going to use what was your spent, what for a given school district, where in the school expenditure distribution in your state were you in 1972, which is before all of the reforms except for California. <coughs> and then we're going to interact your district quartile in 1972 with these dummies for like how far you are from the school finance reform time to construct these kind of event time dummies which we're going to use as instruments and so in our first stage we're going to regress per pupil expenditure in district d at time t on the interaction between these pre-reform spending quartiles and these um 
these event time dummies. And then we're going to control for district fixed effects. We're going to control for um, time trends in terms of what was happening in the 1960s before these things were, were going to happen as well, too. And so this is going to be our main specification for the first stage. And we're going to do the same thing, too, for per pupil expenditure on taxes, per pupil revenues on taxes. So the exact same structure we're going to use there. And then in our second stage, what we're going to do is we're going to take the predicted values for per pupil expenditure that was generated from the school finance reform, which we're going to argue is plausibly exogenous, and I'll show you the event time uh, graphs to, to validate that assumption. And we're going to use that to instrument for per pupil expenditure, and then we're going to regress that on house prices. So that we can, this theta here then is going to be the elasticity of house prices with respect to exogenous changes in school expenditures. Right? Okay, great. And then this, this is going to be our first set of results. And then the second set of results, we're also going to um, include our predicted value for changes in local taxes too, so that we can do this efficiency test as well. Right? And one of the things that you're going to see is including local taxes actually doesn't reduce um, our the predictive power of our school spending too, which, which seems to suggest that these event time dummies that we have are giving us potentially like orthogonal variation in the school spending and also the taxes too, which is what's going to allow us to do our efficiency tests. I'm going to show you several figures like this, so I'll just take some time to like explain what these figures are. So on the horizontal axis, we have the event time. So at time zero is going to be um, <coughs> the time of the, the first court mandated school finance reform. On the vertical axis, we have the log of per pupil spending. And then each of these time series are going to represent the difference between spending in a given uh, pre-reform expenditure quartile relative to um, spending in the districts that spent in the highest quartile before the reform. So, for example, the blue series is going to tell us what's educational expenditure in the lowest quartile versus the top quartile. The green is going to be between, um, the red is going to be between the second smallest quartile and then the, the top quartile, and then this is going to be the third highest quartile. So that makes sense, right? Now you can see before the, v before the school finance reforms, basically there's, there's very little pre-trend here. And then after these school finance reforms, over time, what you see is that the districts that were in the bottom of the spending distribution before the reform, they're going to be spending a lot more money. Right? And this was exactly the point of the reforms, which were to redistribute money towards um, lower spending districts, but then also to provide um, incentives for them to raise more taxes to spend on their schools too. And we're going to see that the increases are going to be, um, they're going to have increases for these middle quartiles as well too, which are going to be smaller than the top. And then you're going to have slight increases for um, the third highest quartile as well too. So there's some ordering here too. Now let's... Why the pattern? I mean, if so, why does it jump up right away? Why does it yeah. fall and then eventually? So what happens is we're using the time that the courts mandated this. Okay. Oftentimes, states now have to go and do legislation, and then they have to make the legislative sausage. And okay. so you can think this is the sausage making um, process okay. here. Jeff and then Jesse. And some states, I think like New Jersey, the state fights the, the yep. judicial court decision too, right? It's yeah. Oftentimes for years or even decades. Yep. No, that, that's, a, that's exactly right. <coughs> Jesse? It, look, it looks like total spending is going up. Yes. So um, if yeah. I remember right, some of this is coming from just general revenue at the state level. Should we worry about income taxes and sales taxes and those sorts of things if some of the location choices across states and not just across jurisdictions within states? Yeah, so then, so income, so state income taxes, are you talking about state income taxes? I don't think you'd worry about state income taxes. Right, because it's like in a sense w the unit of observation is going to be like we're looking at differences within the state, and so everyone's going to be getting shocked by the same state income taxes. Um, in terms of like, if, the, if they really are only considering jurisdictions within the same state. Yeah, and I mean like. That's fair, and so so for some of those border counties, that that can certainly be a consideration. That that might be like second order. Um, in terms of some of the other like local taxes, are you thinking that they might be collinear with um, the property taxes? They're also going to matter. I don't know what direction it would go. I guess. Yeah. So if we had a way, to, if we had a way to measure it, we probably could put that in there too to see. Um, the thing, the reason why we're choosing like local property taxes is because this is the, this is the component of that that's being specifically used to fund um, 
to fund the schools. But you're right, if there are like other types of taxes that are also going to be used to fund schools, then ideally what you'd want to do is to think about like all of the taxes that are going to be used to fund schools, putting them in there. <laughs> I'm trying to, so if we look at, if we look at our summary statistics, so like total spending is going to be like close to $12,000, like 40% of that's going to come from the state, from property tax revenue and then from the state, like close to 50 something percent of that. So like we're left with maybe like 10% that's coming from like other places. So we can use that to kind of like bound the estimates. Yeah. In my understanding, it was constantly like obviously a cap for localities, and then uh, yeah. they can choose to pass a referendum in order to increase spending for schools for that, that year, upcoming years, for like facilities and things like that. I'm just wondering if that plays into it. I will double check, but I think. I think the answer is yes, because oftentimes it's like a referenda to increase property taxes for specific reasons. In the, in the context of California, the referenda were only limited to like infrastructure, but not to general spending. Yeah. There's another question? OK. All right. So everyone clear on the figure? And then, OK. Now I'm going to show you similar figures to these first, and then I'm going to show you like the regressions as well too, right? We want to be really transparent with kind of like what the data is and the variation that we're using. So this is the similar figure for like house prices. Again, like the bottom spending pre-reform quartiles are going to be in the blue. And what you can see is before the reforms, we do have a pre-trend, a negative pre-trend um, <coughs> for the, the two middle quartiles. Um, we don't yet know why this is the case, and we're trying to think about ways to like, deal with this. For the third quartile, we don't see a pre-trend. But if anything, like correcting for this would bias us against finding something like this. So our results would be understated relative to not having that pre-trend. But what we can see is that house prices are going up, right? And so these laws are passed, house prices are going up. OK, now what we're going to do next is we're going to just run um, the two-stage least squares regression that I mentioned earlier, where we're going to be regressing the log of these house price indices on per pupil expenditure, where we're going to instrument for per pupil expenditure using um, the event time dummies interacted with the pre-reform quartiles as our instrument for school spending. OK, there are going to be several tables that you're going to see like this that are going to have a similar structure. So let me take this time to explain the structure of these tables so that you can know what we're doing as we go across the table. So in the first specification, we're just going to include log per people expenditure, and we're going to include district fixed effects and calendar year fixed effects as well, too. When we go to the second specification, we're also going to include these pre-trends, too, from the 1960, um, the 1960 census controlled, interacted with a time variable. And then typically in columns three and four, we're going to use an, a measure of the elasticity of supply from the SIAS paper, and we're going to interact that with our um, per people expenditures to see if there's differential capitalization of increased school expenditures um, based on how elastically or inelastically housing is going to be supplied in your particular geography. So that's going to be columns three and four. And then in the first specification, we're not going to have um, the census time trends. In the next specification, we're going to have the census time trends. So you can see how sensitive it is. And in the last specification, what we're going to do is instead of using the heterogeneity by elasticity, we're going to use the heterogeneity by whether you're an urban school district, suburban, or rural to see if the capitalization is differential across these geographies. So that's going to be the basic structure whenever you see these six tables. The first two is just the relevant estimates. Then the second two is interact with elasticities. And then the last one is going to be by geography. OK. So what do we see here? So we see here that the elasticity of house prices with respect to school spending is about 0.77. Now, when we put in place the census controls, that actually goes up slightly to 0.86. Right? And so controlling for the, the, the pre-trends actually strengthens the result, if anything else. When we look at this by the elasticity of housing supply, what this negative sign is telling us is in places where housing is more elastically supplied, you're actually going to see less capitalization. So for example, let's take a place like um, Dallas, where I think the elasticity of housing supply is like 2.5. You're going to get a capitalization of 0.7 for your elasticity, your house price elasticity. In a place like San Francisco, where the elasticity of housing supply is closer to like 0.6, and housing is more inelastically supplied, you're going to get a house price capitalization that's closer to like 1.3, right? So for each dollar you spend on, on additional dollars you spend on schools, house prices are going to go up by three, yeah. 
And then when we do this by geography, what we see again too consistent with these previous results is that capitalization, house price capitalization is going to be higher in the urban areas relative to the suburban areas and smallest in the rural areas too, which is consistent with what we would expect. Okay. <coughs> So basically, there's this long-standing debate on whether schooling matters. And it seems like, and this more recent literature that shows that schooling matters a lot by looking at these long-term labor market outcomes for workers. And we're pro our analysis is complementary because basically what we're saying is parents are accurately anticipating that more expenditures on schools are going to lead to better outcomes for their kids. And so they're investing in, they're willing to invest a lot more upfront in that education as reflected by the higher house prices and the higher taxes that they're going to pay to. Okay. Now, <coughs> the house prices are going to go up, and so you might worry that what's happening is some people are going to be priced out of these neighborhoods, right? Um, and that's exactly what we find, too. So what we find is that in the districts where house prices go up the most, which are going to be these low-spending districts, you actually see, like, the fraction of kids that are on free and reduced lunch in these schools actually goes down. And so this is, like, corroborating evidence that the house prices indeed are going up, which is that poor households are going to be getting priced out of, of, of these markets, too, right? And this is the similar table, too. You just can see that, like, as you spend more on these schools, you're getting, like, less poor people in this area, too, right? And so something that you might worry about is, well, does this undermine the previous results? Because this suggests that there is going to be some... Mm -hmm. Sure. These, these poor kids, they have to go somewhere. Yeah. Where do they go? Yeah, we're working on that right now. Because you can think about, there could be like a couple of things happening. It could be that um, housing supply is increasing across a lot of different places. And they're differentially sorting to places where that supply is less, um, is more elastic. So that could be the case, right? Um, it could also be the case that keeping housing supply fixed, they're just moving across districts too. What we think is happening is that it's just flattening the gradient between school expenditures and house prices. But we're right now, we're, we're looking at the migration data to really have a better answer for, for that. So I was thinking, unless the, the reform, the housing price change, flip the house price between those two queen tiles you're talking about, yeah. it still needs to be in the bottom. So you see a, a big decline of those kids in the bottom 25%. Can you say that last part again, please, John? So, so you have these poor kids, they were in the bottom 25%. Yeah. And now you see the fraction of them in the 25 in those yeah. districts going down a lot. Yeah. So that has to mean that the housing prices in the better districts are, falling. are lower now. Yeah. Like lower than the worst district now. So you flip the price mm -hmm. on the housing market, is that true? So there is a compression in terms of like house prices. So Carolyn Hawksby has a paper that focuses on Texas and what she finds is that like home values collapse a lot after Texas passes these reforms because in a sense, these reforms reduce the returns to redistribution. So in places that previously used to tax a lot to fund like really great public schools, they start to defund their public schools in a sense and house prices drop for that reason. But right? it has to be lower than the bottom. It doesn't, it depends a lot on, we don't, I don't have a, I don't have a great answer for that right now. That's the honest answer, but we are looking into migration to see where people are moving across space. Is it just that they're fill, the elasticity of supply, is like they're filling in certain places that are expanding more or if they're moving, I don't, yeah. But the headline is that this is corroborating evidence that the, house, that the house prices are going up, right? That you're seeing this kind of a sorting. So what we, <coughs> what we, what we do next is we want to see whether or not the capitalization of school spending into house prices is really genuinely driven by just you're spending more on schools or versus kind of like different people are living in these neighborhoods as well too. Like how much of it is coming from the sorting? Now when we take a, a big step backwards, um, both of those are going to be interesting estimates, right? Because you might say the reduced form effect of the school finance reform is to spend more in schools, and you want to capture both the direct effect of more spending on schools keeping the composition constant, but you might also want to capture the indirect effect of like the induced sorting and how that affects house prices as well too because of this, right? And so that would be the first sets of estimates where you don't account for the sorting. In the second set of estimates, we're going to account for the sorting by just including some school demographics as control. So we're going to control for like the fraction black, 
and white and Hispanic in a neighborhood, how many people are poor slash on free and reduced price lunch, to see how much our estimates change. So in the first column, this is what you saw beforehand where we had the district fix the facts, the calendar year fix the facts, and the census controls, but no district demographics, so not accounting for the sorting that we saw in the previous figure. Um, when we include uh, district demographics, the elasticity does fall by about 17% from 0.8 to 0.7. So sorting does matter, and sorting explains about 20% of the capitalization effect that we see. The balance of it is really going to be explained by the fact that these districts are spending more on schools too. So it's not just operating through the sorting channel. And uh, when we look at the results um, that explore heterogeneity by the elasticity of supply, we see um, similar estimates here. And <coughs> We also see similar estimates when we do by geography. The one thing that's going to be different is that the extent to which capitalization is occurring in urban and suburban areas is going to be a lot more similar in this context than in the context where we didn't control for the sorting. So that's going to be the one thing that's going to be different when we control for the sorting. So sorting does matter. Okay. Now, as advertised, I mentioned that we're going to separately identify the role of spending versus um, lower taxes. And for a lot of reasons, like school spending and taxation are going to be like highly correlated and endogenous in a lot of contexts. And one of the things that we think is going to be nice about our, <coughs> about our context is that we're going to be able to, I, to, to get at some plausibly exogenous variation in, in taxation at the same time that we can get variation in the school spending too. So let me just get to showing you the event study um, graphs. We're working on extending this time series back a little bit further. So <coughs> this is looking at, the on the vertical axis, we have the log of local um, tax revenue from property taxes that goes towards spending uh, in education. And what we can see is that after the reforms are passed, that across the board in these lower spending quartiles, you see an increase in property tax um, revenue. And some of that is going to be coming from the incentives that these jurisdictions have to increase um, their tax base in order to meet like state matching grants and other things like that as well too. And so we're going to use this variation here to see how, how do these plausibly exogenous changes in local tax revenues, how, to what extent do they capitalize into house prices? <coughs> this is looking at um, non-local sources of revenues too. And we can see that non-local sources of revenues like coming from the state and the federal government are going to increase a lot, particularly in these um, low spending districts. And so schools are responding in a sense like schools funding sources are going to be responding to uh, these reforms. The tabular structure is going to be the same as it was previously. The only difference here is going to be that we're also going to have as an explanatory variable um, the log of, of local property taxes per pupil so that we can look at what's the estimate, the elasticity of house prices with respect to taxes. So what we can see here is that when we account for taxes, the, la the capitalization into house prices is going to fall by a bit to about 0.7. And, but we're still getting like a lot of capitalization of school expenditures into house prices. Um, with taxes, this elasticity is like minus, um, minus 0.15 here. And then again, too, we're going to see that school spending is going to be more capitalized in places where, supply, where, where the elasticity of supply is is going to be um, lower. Um, with the taxes, um, it's going to be a little less imprecisely estimated when we start to split by the elasticity. <coughs> so the, the point estimates f are going to be kind of similar, but when we add in this interaction with elasticity, it doesn't, it doesn't change by, by that much. Um, when we split it out by geography, what we see is we get the same kind of a sorting, right? Where school expenditures are going to be highly capitalized into urban areas, um, also into suburban areas, less so into rural areas. But when we look at the sensitivity towards taxes, we're going to see that in these suburban areas, there's going to be a lot of sensitivity towards taxes. Also in the rural areas, too, people are going to be pretty sensitive to taxes. <laughs> we're less our estimates are less precise for the rural areas because they just make up 6% of the sample. And then the urban areas, like the sensitivity to taxes is going to be like the lowest, right? So these are going to be the results. What we're going to do next is we're going to take these elasticities and then perform that efficiency um, test that we were mentioning, that, uh, that we mentioned at the top of the talk. And so the exercise is going to be, we want to calculate the resulting increase in house prices from that derive from increasing school expenditures because we've increased taxes. So you, in you increase taxes, you use that money to fund schools, 
how does that affect house prices? So effectively, what you're doing is you're saying, <coughs> we increase taxes, I'm going to get a negative hit on house prices from that, but we take all of that money and dump it into school expenditures, we get a positive hit from that, and then we net out that difference to see if, in fact, we can raise uh, house prices by providing more of the local public good, which is going to be schools. That's going to be the exercise, right? Okay. So in the first column, this is where we do it for like all areas, and again, too, like with the census controls versus without the census controls. And what we find is a 1% increase in taxes to fund education increases house prices by about 0.06%, which is, which is economically small and statistically insignificant, too. The standard errors aren't tiny, so I just want to be really upfront about that. When we split this by geography, and this was the result that I showed you previously, when we look at urban areas, the elasticity is about 0.2. In suburban areas, in sorry, in suburban areas, it's about 0.02, which is an order of magnitude smaller, and in rural areas, it's like way, way smaller and like super close to zero too. And so, what's the what's the headline from this? The headline from this is that, on average, it seems that it seems that spending on on schools is approximately efficient in the sense that we've defined efficiency. Right? There's no arbitrage in this, in this particular market. But in urban areas, like, it's an order of magnitude like, larger. Like, there are potentially some gains to like, increasing taxes in urban areas to fund public schools. Right? And this is consistent with the whole idea that you know, a lot of our urban schools are in, pretty, like, are in pretty bad shape and have been systematically defunded over time. Um, what we can do next... Can go yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Are you just 0.7 plus minus 0.15? That's what you did? No, no, no. That's not what we did. So what we did is we, what we say is if you increase taxes by 1%, given the level of taxes, that's going to generate a certain dollar amount increase in spending. We take that dollar amount in spending, and then we do that as a proportion of the current level of spending to get a percentage increase in spending. And then we multiply that percent increase in spending by the elasticity of spending. And that number we add to 1%, and then that will give us the net increase in house price, the net percent increase in house prices. Yeah. Yeah, because if, yeah, you're absolutely right, because if we just added those elasticities, there's no way we, we, would get, um, we would get zero. The last thing that we do is we separate out, so there's this literature showing that expenditures on teacher salaries seems to be really effective in terms of increasing test scores. And also to like a big um, debate in the literature has been that the type of school expenditures might matter. And so we wanted to see in this context if we can make some progress on that question. And so what we do is when we split out our expenditures into salary and non-salary expenditures, what we find is that Salary expenditures increase in these districts that before the reform were not spending as much as the upper quartile districts. And so we, we can see that happening. We don't have too much of a pre-trend here. When we look at non-salary expenditures, they also increase in the lowest expenditure quartiles as well too. Less so for the, um, the middle quartiles of, of spending. And what we can do next is we can say, well, let's estimate a regression where we have the log of house prices against the predicted value of expenditures on salary versus non-salary inputs as a way of seeing to what extent do households differentially capitalize expenditures on these two different types of inputs as well too, right? And so like how discerning are households about the type of expenditure? And what we can see is that across the board, like increases in salaries are positively capitalized into, into house prices by like a lot, right? Whereas when we look at this non-salary expenditure, it's actually negatively capitalized into house prices. And one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to add taxes onto this because we think what could be happening is if your non-salary expenditure includes things like spending on infrastructure and those things happen when you have a bond referenda that gets passed, in a sense, like the non-salary expenditure could be positively correlated with taxes and then taxes are going to be negatively correlated with your house values. And so some of this negative could actually be coming through the fact that, you know, like these types of expenditures are actually um, collinear with, um, with taxes. So we're going to redo this piece here and add that in. <coughs> but when we 
when we split by geography, what we see is that across the board, the salary expenditures are almost very similarly capitalized into house prices, which is pretty shocking because we see on average the capitalization into house prices of school expenditures was, was much higher in urban areas relative to rural areas. But when we look at a specific category of expenditures, which is going to be on these salary inputs, like households across the board are going to like value um, inputs into salaries too, right? And this is consistent with the idea that households are potentially acting rationally if it's these salary inputs that are going to be differentially effective in terms of improving student academic performance, but also improving students' um, life, lifelong outcomes. And this is my last slide, and then we probably will have like another 10 or so minutes to have conversation because it goes until, yeah? Okay, great. I think this is going to be like my first time finishing like 10 minutes I had for it to talk, so I feel good about that. So what's the conclusion? So our work speaks to these two long-standing debates within the economics literature. One is this like really old question going back to like Samuelson and Musgrave about can we efficiently provide um, public goods? And in particular, can we provide them at the local level? And using um, plausibly exogenous variation in both expenditures on the local public good and then also in the taxes, we're able to like estimate the elasticity of house prices with respect to these two inputs and then test for whether or not efficiency can, can actually happen. And then the second thing that we speak to is does f expenditures on schooling matter, right? I know a number of, of the faculty in this room and also the students think very deeply about education. And there has been a long-standing debate in the literature about whether spending on school matters. And the tide is only recently beginning to turn towards where people are saying, well, if we spend more in schools, the schools get better. Before that, you know, there was a potential for folks to believe that expenditures on schools are a black hole. So what we show is that house prices go up when school expenditure increases exogenously. And this is a revealed preference like piece of evidence that school funding matters. People actually want to pay more for the houses in places where there's more expenditures on schools. Like even if they're completely irrational and they just think that schools are cool, even if the schools don't educate their kids, households care about it. And to the extent that they vote, it's like we should, we, we, we want to listen to them. Uh, this also corroborates the evidence that more school spending improves childhood outcomes, right, which we know from prior literature. And this is basically parents forecasting this into the future and saying, I'm going to treat education as an investment good and invest money, more money up front um, by buying, by spending more in houses and places where people, um, where, where, the, where the expenditures on schools are higher. And then we propose a way to jointly estimate the elasticity of house prices with respect to school expenditure and also the elasticity of house prices with respect to taxation. And then we hearken back to this um, test of efficiency from Oates to test whether it's efficient. And we use this using publicly available data that spans the country and that spans time too. And so we're able to reduce the data requirements um, necessary and we're also able to increase the external validity of these estimates and to speak to this efficiency question, not just with respect to infrastructure funding, but with respect to funding um, in general, which we think is, is really important from a policy standpoint. And then our headline is, we provide some evidence that, you know, Tibu's initial insight was correct, which is there is scope to provide public goods efficiently at the local level, right? This was a huge debate back then. This is not to say that we should just think about efficiency very narrowly given the economic constraints of folks, right? There might be a number of reasons for why we might think, why we might care about people's ability to spend on schools above and beyond just their, above and beyond their budget constraints, right? Like one reason could be, I have a really great school district, I educate kids here, these kids may actually work in another place that's not too nearby, right? So like there should be some geographic spillovers. And so that's, that's one of the clear limitations of thinking about efficiency in this very narrow way. But still, it, from, a, from a conceptual standpoint, it's incredibly important to like really engage this idea about can we provide public goods at a local level? And also to think really deeply too about this question of like, does school funding matter? And for us as, 
a social scientist, and specifically as economists, like finding out from a revealed preference study that people value these expenditures is incredibly important because it's not just about society foisting a particular set of social preferences onto households, but this is really uncovering the fact that they do value this and when we don't do this, we're potentially doing something that's suboptimal from a, from a policy standpoint. Um, I will stop there and then take any questions that you have in the remaining five minutes, Joe. Um, so the, the way you infer the property tax increase for, for, for property spending is to look at the expenditure coming from property tax. Yeah. Instead yeah. of you observing property tax going up. That's right. So suppose the local government didn't increase the property tax, all they did is shifting money around. They spent less on collecting garbage. Yeah. So then the housing price declined because of the environment is worse now, not because of property tax is higher now. So they shift money from they shift money from garbage to education? Okay, and then you're saying they shift money from, so then, so then the way that we can think about it is there are these different buckets along which the locality can allocate um, the tax expenditure, mm -hmm. right? And if alloc reallocating money away from garbage to schools increases house prices, then the previous, the, the previous allocation of resources across these different buckets was inefficient or was suboptimal. From from that was suboptimal from that standpoint. Another question. So uh, the you say the the increase in the property tax is uh, because the local government has to match the fund from the state government when you have the finance report. Yeah. So like there 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 are like state matching grants. There are like other like this varies a lot across state, but there are incentives for some for some local jurisdictions to like increase their tax base because there are going to be some supplements potentially from the from the government from the state and local so government. So my question is, do I have to take that? Can I leave it? Is it mandate or not? That's my question. I don't know the I don't know the answer to that, but I'll I'll look it up. Is your th what's your thinking about whether, like, how the whether it's mandatory or not? So I'm thinking about whether or not this is uh, really like a document shock. So the, the district that increases the spending is the district that takes the bait instead of like mm -hmm. this, you have to do it. We can, we can certainly look into that because yeah if, if some states are basically because you see this with some federal programs right like I know in South Carolina when we had a hurricane um, the governor of South Carolina was like no I don't want any like state money mm -hmm. and so on and so forth or even if you look at the financial crisis Goldman Sachs was like don't give us the money and the Obama administration was like you must take this 25 billion dollars or else right so we can we can totally look into that uh, how much so I'm thinking that the housing prices are going to be driven by how much people care about the next generation which is going to have to do with parental altruism toward their kids, which you probably can't measure, but also how many kids people have in different places. Yeah. So have you looked at that gradient at all, like family size and how any of this varies? Like so the idea is that, like, is there heterogeneity in the house price capitalization by who is living in the area? So in some sense, like, let's say you take, like, a predetermined characteristic, like you said, like, what was the mix, the family mix beforehand? Like, how many people had kids in the pre-reform period and then interact that with the with the shock with yeah. the event time dummies we have so the second paper so this paper is like one in a series of three papers that we're doing um in the not the second paper i think in the third paper what we're going to do is we're going to explore heterogeneity in the shock by um things like this to really like estimate a sorting model to basically kind of like to estimate like a structural sorting model to see like how much do people value like the demographic characteristics of the neighborhood and so on and so forth so that is something that's on our agenda for for the follow-up paper. What we wanted to do with this paper is really to say there, there are these two big questions. Does school expenditure matter? And then an even bigger question, can we fund local public goods? Can we fund um, public goods at the local level? And we wanted to really say, here's a context, which is the provision of education where we can test that. We can 
use what we think is plausibly exogenous variation in both taxes and expenditure, and then we can look at how that's capitalized in house prices to test the efficiency. And so we're going after this like really kind of like big idea, like linking back to this old literature. And then what that does too is it really sets up these school finance reforms as instruments both for school spending, but then also taxation that can be used in other work, but then also too that can be used to test for like sorting as well. I think I'm out of time officially. Maybe one more? Okay. One more we have like Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.